<laughs> okay. Let's grant the absurdity of the grief in the theory, just as the theory proposes. No one double checked. I'm sorry, do I, I'm, sometimes I'm a cynic here, but no one double checked this? Along these lines, consider Peter's preaching at Pentecost in Acts uh, 40 days after Jesus' resurrection. The book of Acts records Peter preached and many were converted. In fact, on a number of occasions, it states those who heard of Jesus converted when the apostles preached. You see, Jerusalem would have been uh, bustling with talk of either conspiracy or resurrection. Should also be noted that Jesus' tomb was in the very same rock formation of Golgotha, which was also a well-known location. It was a site of many crucifixions. Only two kilometers, or 1.2 miles away from the Temple Mount area of Jerusalem. So Peter was preaching one day, a bunch of people converted, and nobody hopped down there to check it out. No shepherd, no tradesman, no future converts went to check out whether or not the tomb was empty. Further, there is no recorded magisterial or govern action, governing action against the new Christian converts in Jerusalem for over a decade following the crucifixion. What was it that uh, happened that caused the local government there to change their tune and how they treated the apostles? Why would they treat them any different than Jesus? Additionally, Roman soldiers were the toughest, most fierce soldiers of the ancient world. A troop of them vigilantly guarded the tomb's entrance. <coughs> Failing at a soldier's post would have resulted in punishment and potentially death. The disciples would have not been able to fight, bribe, or sneak past such a troop. And certainly, a barely revived Jesus could not have made it past them, let alone rolled away one to two stone, two-ton stone guarding the tomb's entrance. With regards to the hallucination theory, it is important to note the difference between an optical illusion and a hallucination. An optical illusion is self-explanatory. A repeat hallucination seen in multiple locations by different people multiple times is a different matter altogether. A hallucination is a private event, like a dream. Your brain produces it. So you cannot share a hallucination with someone any more than you could invite them to come into your dream and dream it with you. Those who suffer hallucination tend to be very sick. Typically they're paranoid, schizophrenic, under the influence of an intoxicant, have a tumor, or have some kind of biochemical problem. So you see, not only are the factors of the empty tomb and the Roman guards a problem for the hallucination theory, but even more so is the notion of the same hallucination by multiple witnesses in multiple settings over multiple days. Except for the insane, except for the insane, the uh, hallucinations usually only happen once, whereas many different people, I'll say it again, over a 40-day period purport to have the same hallucination, even as much as 500 people at the same time would have had to hallucinate the same hallucination for that theory to be correct. Those who supposedly hallucinated also spoke and touched, with Je uh, touched Jesus. I don't know about you, but it doesn't seem to me that you could interact with the hallucination very well. Maybe you can't. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a specialist there. I don't know. Susie, Nate, is that, is that you interact? You're interacting with me, right? So. Yes. The fact is, none of Jesus' followers appeared to have suffered from the kind of debilitating condition that would cause a hallucination. Quite the contrary, Jesus and his followers were intelligent and organized. Consider how swiftly Christianity expanded through the Roman Empire. 
so much so that by AD 64, Nero was persecuting the Christians. Finally, and perhaps the greatest evidence for resurrection counter the swoon theory is the nature of Roman crucifixion itself and the extent of Jesus' wounds. The act, uh, Romans were experts at torture and killing. The Roman military was the greatest raging death machine of its time. They could crucify someone in as little as 12 minutes. The length of someone's life in crucifixion paralleled how much the victim was to suffer and to be made a spectacle of. Jesus hung alive somewhere between four to six hours. Death by crucifixion would come from many sources. Acute shock from blood loss, dehydration, stress-induced heart attack, congestive heart failure, leading to cardiac rupture, seizure, asphyxiation, and more. Beyond the excruciating pain, crucifixion inhibited uh, breathing, the weight of the body pulling on the arms and the shoulders fixed the respiratory muscles in an inhalation state, hindering exhalation. The lack of adequate respiration resulted in severe muscle cramps, which compounded breathing. A simple breath required one to push up against their feet, flex from the elbows, pulling from the shoulders that were attached to the hands that were latched to the cross. Jesus was latched by nails. When the nail was driven through the wrist, it severed the large median nerve and produced excruciating pain down all of his arm and down his side that resulted in a claw-like grip like this. And if the victim did not die quickly enough, their legs were broken. The two alongside Jesus, their legs were broken. Additionally, Jesus was also flawed almost to death before crucifixion. The Romans had various kinds of whips they used to tear open the victim's back. The flowing blood would clot the surface only to be ripped to open again and again and again. Recall that Jesus' torture was so horrendous that he couldn't carry the cross beam to the crucifixion site. Once on the site, the iron spikes that were driven through Jesus' wrists and feet would have created large open wounds that could be easily contaminated and infected. History also records that insects would burrow into the wounds of their uh, victim's eyes, even while still alive. And sometimes birds of prey would encircle the site and feed off the victims. On top of all this, if that wasn't enough, Jesus was speared through. When he was speared through, the water and the blood poured out separately. This is an unmistakable indicator of his death. Water separates from the blood when the organs, when the organs have stopped. And then after his death, Jesus was prepared for burial according to uh, Jewish custom, which uh, entailed encasing his body in wrapped linen and spices. Revived in the cool, damp air of the tomb, and capable of moving a one to two stone, and then overpower a troop of Roman guards? I think not. I must confess that it was a struggle to prepare for today's message. I had to leave out some of the details about crucifixion. They're very gruesome. But I did spend a lot of time pondering them. It was very troubling to me to consider just how appalling and evil humanity can be. The extent of Jesus' suffering is
is haunting. He hung naked on a cross for hours alive with spikes in his hands and his feet, open wounds, wounds, shamed and flogged. I heard one therapist even talk about the way he hung, the social shaming, being naked was equivalent to like a rape. So I think we gotta ask the question, what was it that got Jesus crucified? Jesus was a political, social, and religious revolutionary. Some have even called him an anarchist. He was so committed to his message that he is executed for it. So earlier I asked you to consider the difference between expectation, anticipation, and hope. Many sermons have been preached about how Israel expected a military Messiah when they should have anticipated something more. But I want to argue today that Jesus' message exceeds anticipation. Anticipation is self-generated. Jesus' message was one of hope extending beyond what we could have ever anticipated on our own. With God, all things are possible. Hope exceeds anticipation. Its confidence is outside of itself and the one who has ultimate authority over creation. Jesus' message of hope was an authority that broke the oppressive cycles of violence, scarcity, and despair. So I want to read a section of scripture to you that puts this message on display. This is what, and this is the kind of thing that Jesus was crucified for. The reason why I read this to you is because I think his message is just as much, if not more, an evidence of his origin and nature than just the resurrection. Early in the morning, out of John chapter eight, Jesus came to the temple. All people came to him, and he sat down and taught. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the very act of adultery. And the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. What do you say? They said this to test Jesus so that it might have some charge to bring against them. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She replied, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. He doesn't place obligation on you. He lifts you up out of obligation. He doesn't condemn you. He loves you. He gives you new insights. He gives you hope for the future. He gives you a future. This is his legacy and indicative of his origin. Human ways are very foreign to it. We need it. So I want us to end grabbing a neighbor or two and talking about how you might find hope this week. <clears throat> Encourage each other in Christian hope and how you might look for something outside of yourself and put your faith in God to deliver you from those things. Okay, can we do that for about five minutes?